Tony Starr, uh, can you ask each of you guys to tell us a little bit about yourselves and how you came individually to be working with Tim? Well, I, um, I, f I found Tim initially on a blog and something just caught my attention about his work. And it wasn't like as if he was hyped or anything. I just remember feeling something and I found out he was Swedish. Um, we met and then everything kind of grew organically from there. I didn't even mean to be his manager. I still don't want to be a manager today. I never wanted to. It just you know, grew, grew out that way and it's worked great for us. The relationship um, just clicked and the rest is history. Yeah, I was in Tomorrowland actually. Me and Ash went out, had a good night. And then a couple of months later, I worked in an English agency back then. We obviously know each other because both of us were promoter back in the days, like for five years, competing promoters in different cities in Sweden. Um, yeah, you should come work for me now. <laughs> okay. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I was uh, working with Ash on another company doing something completely different um, almost five years ago and things changed at that company. And that was by the time Ash uh, figured that he was supposed to do this full time. And uh, yeah, I joined the team because yeah, we, we got along very well and we worked good as a team. Okay. Uh, Ash, Tim has described to Billboards uh, your label PRMD Music as the most innovative artist-centered label out there. Can you give us some examples of what he's referring to, please? Well, I didn't even read that myself. Um, but um, everything that we do based is based on creativity. I mean, even on the business side, you know, we think very creatively. It's very important for us that we do things out of the box because to break through the noise, unless you know you have access to either huge resources or big capital, it's kind of hard, you know. And, and we once proved with Avicii that we could do it on our own. Um, and we're still kind of proving that today. So I think that's what he's referring to, if anything. Okay. It seems that from the start, it was all about teamwork in building Avicii, that it wasn't just a one-man operation. You, you wanted to call in the best talents you could find. Is that, was that your business model? Well, it, initially, it was just t Tim and I, you know, and that was the team. So, and we worked really closely together. It wasn't like, you know, I was expecting to get orders from Tim or or anyone else for that matter. You know, we, we kind of uh, had split responsibilities and we delivered to each other, so to say. You know, that, that was our commitment. You know, I was uh, uh, obviously, um, Tim, Tim was obviously super focused on the music. I wanted him to be super focused on the music. I didn't want him to think about anything else. I didn't, I didn't want him to worry um, if, you know, the next gig was the right gig or if the next release was the right release at the right time, et cetera, because it just clouds um, creativity, if you ask me. So I took all that away from him and, and asked him to trust me, and he did. And that's how we built this. Okay. Carl, can you tell us a little bit about partnering with Island Records to release True, how that business partnership came about and why it was important? I mean, that was really like our, our repertoire owner is Universal Sweden. And throughout the years, we've been, we've been working with almost all of the Universal family US labels. Um, for this release, we wanted to go with something fresh, you know, to, get, to have a team that was fully committed to this project that we knew was going to become a success. And obviously, all the all the local Universal offices are, or the label offices are, are very important in, in doing that big of a push. Um, Island Def Jam, by that time, was uh, was the right partner for that, and they felt that they were more of a partner that could tag along on what we, what we were already doing, um, being PRMD and, and utilizing all the relationships that we've been gathered throughout the years to, to make this such a huge success. Okay, thank you. Uh, Panos, just to talk about uh, Ultra this year, obviously Avicii couldn't play because he had to go to the hospital for his gallbladder and appendicitis. How was that situation for the team when you have to obviously react quickly to protect your guy first and foremost, but then also ensure that you know fans and people aren't out of pocket, for example? Yeah, it was uh, stressful. Thankfully, it was not the first time we ever did it. We've, we've been in that situation before. And um, first and foremost, it's about the fans, making sure that we're transparent with them, inform them. We didn't just have to cancel Ultra, we had to cancel the whole April. 
We had a Middle East tour with 50,000 tickets sold in Dubai and Bahrain. Um, we even had, we had a true tour in America that we had to cancel the first weekend. We had to postpone it to the end, to the end of June. So it's, it's all about telling the fans first. And are you and Tim committed to going back to these places and doing the shows at some point when the schedule allows? We're trying to. We had to postpone one of the tours. We did one weekend to the end of um, October, and we're doing um, one weekend in Washington and Boston, right? Yeah, in, in June, connected to the, uh, to the New York shows. Okay. If we go back one year to Ultra last year when Tim premiered Wake Me Up, I don't think anyone there was expecting a bluegrass band. Uh, can you first of all tell us about the, the run-up to Ultra, knowing that you were going to unveil this new song and this new sound and probably cause some scratching of heads? Um, well, uh, again, you know, it's about, it was a creative approach to launching an album. I mean, it was our first studio album. Even though Tim had been around, he was, you know, very appreciated as an as an established artist in the electronic space, he'd still not released a single album. He was all based on singles. And we knew that, you know, we had a challenge there. I mean, album sales aren't what they used to be. It's very single driven, the whole industry. Um, and we were looking to launch an album our way and kind of keep it alive our way. And we had plenty of ideas how to do that. On, you know, launch specifically, um, we wanted to provoke. That, that was the whole, um, you know, that was the whole, uh, agenda. We wanted to provoke, even though it was just for 15 minutes out of his 90-minute set. Um, that was the intention of bringing up a live band on this stage that had, you know, pumping uh, club music for hours on end, and um, you know, people were more or less playing the same kind of sounds, um, very energetic. And then we come, and in the middle of his set, there's a 15-minute break of of live instruments, and including a banjo. And that obviously, you know, uh, it was all obviously provoked people. I mean, we didn't, we didn't set out to kind of create hate or anything, but we knew, based just, just from experience, people hate on whatever's new, and people hate on whatever's successful. And, and you know, there's ways of taking cheap shots at, 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 you know, anything you put out there. So we wanted to make it overly easy for people to hate and then kind of use that for promotion. Now, what we didn't expect was it to be like 95% hate coming out of that. You know, but, but we used it in our favor. We actually, you know, if you go back on my Twitter, you know, I met people in our, in our business, kind of our business relationships. People were like worried. They were like, what have you done? You know, people are hating you. They're saying you can't ever come back from this. And um, I actually, there were so many people that said this. I, I went out on Twitter and I said, you know, don't worry. In one week, everyone will understand. Because we knew, we, in, we already had a plan going into that kind of provo provocation that we were going to use all that hate and create buzz around what was happening. So people would be curious of finding out for themselves. And whoever, you know, 95% of, of whatever the number of people that were at Ultra, that wasn't, that wasn't all our fan base. So we knew that that wasn't really, you know, um, it wasn't them that we'd have to, you know, um, um, it wasn't them that we'd had to bring in attention from on the project, it was everyone else. So within, I think a few days, we started collecting all the hate posted online, and we posted it, reposted it on Avicii's social, like just uncensored, and said, you know, check out what the fuss is about, and then linked to a SoundCloud mix that put the songs in perspective, you know, where there wasn't live instruments, that we reworked into a normal club set, and you could hear it really work. And, you know, surely enough, within a week, I think, um, or something, you know, the, that 95% hate turned into 95% love for what we were doing. Right. So there was, you were never shaken in your confidence that you weren't going to alienate a significant proportion of his, the dance community? No, you, you can't be. I mean, as long as you keep your, 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 your artist's integrity, as long as you, you kind of um, produce whatever it is or, or release whatever it is that you can stand behind, if the fans you know, want to turn against that or, or if they don't understand, then I guess they're not your fans anymore, you know? Okay. That's kind of the, the, the attitude that we had going into okay. it. It was uh, used in the, I think, the second trailer for the Lego movie, is that correct? Yes. Did you notice there was a big uptick in the demand for sinks from Avicii since when the single came out? Um, yeah, I mean, there's always been, you know, a lot of things going, going on with, with Tim's work. And, uh, but, I mean, you know, obviously with, with this, 
with this success, the syncs and the requests and everything has been more intensified. Mm -hmm. And in the video, you had promotional usage of Ralph Lauren clothing, for example, and the, the Sony smartphone. Is it part of the business model to pursue these partnerships, you know, aggressively, but also creatively? Yeah, for us and, you know, the, 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 the relationship that we have with Ralph Lauren that has been a partner for, for the last couple of years and, you know, has been, has been part of Tim's career since, since the early days. Um, the, way, the way we used them for, for the video was uh, that we got access to a completely, like, next level uh, media reach, which we would never be able to just achieve with, with the traditional channels and also with... Um, you know, with, with the traditional way of working music videos on, on a declining, uh, like, music, television, and only YouTube. Mm. And it also gets Ralph Lauren into Europe and Asia on the, on the back of dance music, which, you know, they're struggling to do otherwise. Of course, yeah. So it works for them. Um, you did an innovative gig at Roseland Ballroom, uh, where it was sponsored by Ralph and Macy's, and entry, the entry ticket was a T-shirt. Yeah. People. So can you tell us about how that, how that innovative uh, one-off came Th about? That's actually more a question for Carl, to be honest. Okay. Business relationships with okay. Ralph Lauren. Well, tell, how, how, how did the promoters at uh, Roseland, were they cool with that? Did they like this idea? Yeah. I mean, the thing is, they, you know, it's, it's not a normal way to promote a show. But on the other hand, you know, it was, um, we knew that it would be Avicii fans going to that show anyway. They would be the ones that would buy the T-shirts and then line up to go to that show. For us, it wasn't very different. It was just a different way of selling the ticket um, with our partner. And it, it was, you know, uh, whenever you work with someone, you know, there's um, um, there, there are different asks, you know, from both ends. And, it, it, you know, you, you want to meet somewhere where it's, where it's a credible thing for both that, you know, nobody's really compromising what they're about. And um, this was just one of those things. You know, everybody knows us being creative about our approach to everything, and, and it made sense. Okay. Yeah, to add to that, is, is this on? Yeah, to add to that, we did something similar the year before, where Ash came up with, um, with on the House for Hunger with the USB sticks. So it, it, that was also in connection with uh, with Ralph Lauren. Okay. You, uh, I mean, he's played the Hollywood Bowl, you know, 17,000 people. He sold out Radio City Music Hall, first DJ to ever do that. These are very traditional concert venues. Were promoters and owners of these venues at all skeptical that? someone like Avicii could, first of all, fill these venues, and did they also maybe worry that the fans would meet all their cliched fears of dance music fans? I mean, that's something that we started working on three years ago, really, to go into those venues, and we, we did those venues, yes, but we also did a, a true tour over three weeks in Europe, where we sold 230,000 tickets, and it was also pure sports venues. We sold 80,000 tickets in Sweden over, over two, two nights and was, yeah, the whole tour was just amazing. We do the same thing now in, in, in America and then we're taking the tour into Europe again in, and during the summer. Okay. I mean, there was a, the show in Toronto last weekend, 29 fans got taken to hospital because they'd overindulged. Do, you, does the, do dance music artists still get blamed for that kind of behavior? Well, I think um, it's, it's hard in any kind of gathering of a lot of people to, to completely um, de defend anyone against, you know, just things happening. Everyone has to, you know, take responsibility for themselves. But I mean, as long as the promoters do their job, you know, and, and take um, whatever precautions you can ask of them um, that are reasonable without interfering with, with um, um, you know, the whole idea of having a show. Obviously, you want to, we want 20,000 people in a, in a venue, um, there are, you know, restrictions on, on, on what you can do creatively because of, of, of security and, 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 you know, uh, everything from, from toilets, to toilets to um, logistics of parking and how people get there. I think every time something like this comes up, people are quick to say, oh, look at electronic music, it's so bad, but I don't think any big gathering of people, whether, whether that be in, 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 in a, you know, cultural event, religious event, or a concert event, I don't think anyone gets away from, from the dangers associated with, with big gatherings of people. You know, at the, end of the day, at the end of the day, you can't really stop people from doing whatever they feel like. I mean, even though you have barriers of, of security, people could just, you know, 
barge it at any time. You can't really uh, affect their minds in that sense. Sure. Panas, I mean, EDM ticket prices in the States have generally been lower than pop and rock acts tickets, and also the artists tend to do more shows. Is that a model that you and Avicii want to sustain? Yeah, we're trying to, to keep the ticket price as low as possible, but I mean, the cost of putting up a big production in a big venues, it, it's a big difference from putting up a, a show in a club. An example, and, and you don't have the, all the overage from, for example, bars, etc. It's a proper concert. It's expensive. We need to take. We need. We need to go. You know, plus minus and all zero. But um, yeah, we try to keep it down. We did the same thing yes last year in Ibiza. We tried to keep it at 50 euros around that, and um, in, in the UK shows that we do, we try to keep it at around 35, 40 pounds. Mm. Okay. I think it's way cheaper than many rock concerts, but. I mean, we, put, we, we sell as many tickets as they do, some of them, in some venues. Mm, okay. Carl, um, can you tell us about dealing with FIFA for doing the World Cup song? How, how difficult or otherwise was it dealing with a huge football body? I, I think that's actually more of Ash's table, okay. since he was the one um, putting that together. Could you repeat the question? I just heard FIFA. So, so um, the Avicii is doing the World Cup anthem uh, with Wyclef Jean and Alexander Pires and Carlos Santana. How was it dealing with FIFA? You know, it's not a, not a body that's known for its smooth bureaucracy. Well, no, I mean, and, and you know, they got lots of stuff, you know, they got lots of stuff on their hands right now because the big World, World Cup uh, um, playoffs are coming up. Um, it's hard to get answers the same way you would go about normal, bi normal music business. Um, they're, they don't re they're not really that concerned with the music side of things because their core business is obviously the sport. So it's not, it's, it's not, you know, it's not easy to get prioritized when, you, when you're looking for, for answers and you want to plan ahead the way we, we would want to. Um, but, you know, it's a big, it's a big milestone. You know, we're, we're fans of the sport, so it's a great honor to be able to be part of that. Okay, and he's playing the uh, closing ceremony, isn't he? I believe for the World Cup. Is that? Is that? Can you bring any of your production values to that event? No, that's a big FIFA production. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it looks great though. Really? <laughs> okay. Can you see a DJ playing the Super Bowl halftime anytime soon? Yeah, I hope so. Why not? Yeah. Do you think mainstream America is ready for that? I mean, you. You don't really. You don't really. You know, when um, I think that you know, it's a show like any other. Um, people can can hate on you know the the DJ phenomenon all they want, but really, it's just a a producer's way of performing. If you look at it, you know, and you have every element of the show. But you know, at least in 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 our shows, you know, you have every element of a show that you would have on a live concert. It's just that the you know the elements are different. It's just different. Different people, um, or, or you, you replace, you know, maybe a guitar with with an effect, or you, you know, it depends on how you look at it. You 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 um, replace the energy with a combination of visuals and lights and, and music. Um, so I think it, it, there's no reason for why it couldn't um, be on any stage in the world. Okay. Yeah, I would love to see a DJ be carried in by some gladiators. <laughs> you know, in halftime would be amazing. But but to add, uh, I mean. What we've seen and what we learned on the True Tour is that traditionally, even if you go into a venue like O2, in example, you only sold the actual floor, the dance floor, but we forced the promoters to go and sell all the way up, you know, all the tires, tiers, tier, tires, sorry. Uh, and it was amazing to see the people, they were dancing like crazy all the way up, you know, on, on, on the upper levels. It was, it was a good experience, it was a fun experience, and, and to prove that you can actually do that. Uh, Carl, uh, there's a lot of coverage given to Forbes' uh, highest earning DJs list. They had uh, Avicii at number six with a four, an income estimated at $20 million. Uh, Calvin Harris, of course, was number one with $46 million. Firstly, how accurate are these figures? And secondly, is it helpful to you guys having these figures out there when you're trying to negotiate on behalf of Tim? I mean, all of them are just based on speculations and based on data that they can collect from certain societies. Um, they then multiply that to try to get like a worldwide figure. Um, for me, it's, it's, it's just nonsense, really. Is it more of a hindrance then when you're trying to negotiate deals because people expect them to? It's really nothing, like, because how would you be able to negotiate something based on something that's just nothing? Mm. Okay. Ash, how is it for you when these figures come out? Is it frustrating? 
we don't really pay attention to them. I mean, we have, you know, we all have our way of doing business, and it's not going to change whether someone posts an article or or, uh, uh, or a figure of what they think that we make or don't make. It doesn't really matter. I mean, it's all about. I mean, demand is what drives, you know, the the, the size of venue and and, and and the shows that you can do. Mm -hmm. Okay. In terms of work that Tim has out now or coming up, he's obviously produced and played piano on the Coldplay song, A Sky Full of Stars, which is their new single. Chris Martin said he's worried that he was cheating on his band when he asked Tim to be involved. How did that collaboration come about? <laughs> well, I was, I, was, I was talking to their manager for about two years, like, um, you know, <laughs> uh, asking him to give us a shot with Chris because we were huge fans of him. Um, and the time just never came until, you know, when we started talking again around um, a project they were doing, because um, we had kept in touch, and and I, you know, and I kind of said, you know, let's let's just, you know, I'll, I'll help you on whatever. Let's just get them in the studio together, and you know, they just really um, create a spark between them. That's how it came about. Okay. Really easy. All right. Uh, he's also been working with Madonna on her album. Um, now we won't expect you to give us any figures. But can you give us an insight into the conversations and deal making that led to that collaboration? Well, again, I mean, there was no real deal making. It came from an idea, um, again, from her manager and I, uh, speaking around her her new um, material. And I just asked to have a week with people that I could put in there. Tim, obviously, being um, the lead figure, but I put just Swedish songwriters and, and, and producers in there with with them and, and you know she was super happy and you know everything um, that came out of that I think was you know blew them away I think they were super impressed. Mm. Do you know how many tracks he's going to have on the album in the end? No, it's it's far from done. Okay, is it similar to the Mirways when he worked with her? Is that kind of relationship? From the what? Mirways when he did Ray of Light with her. Oh, I have no idea. Okay. All right. Um, Niall Rogers said yesterday in London at the Ivor Novello Awards that he's, him and Tim are working together in LA soon. Is that for the next uh, Avicii Artist album? Yeah, and um, you know, we'll see. I mean, we'll, we have an album that will probably come out this year. Um, um, but regardless, you know, there's, there's such a speed to, the, to, to uh, you know, his craft that, that there's so much material. We, don't, we haven't really decided what we want to do. We're not, we're not really f positioning him as a producer yet, even though we've done these things for Coldplay and Madonna, but you never know. Mm -hmm. Okay. In terms of the, the next live thing that you want to do, are you working on a new production? Yeah, we're working on a Macy production actually for 2015 with the new album. Um, but first is the festivals for this summer. Ibiza, we're putting a lot of effort in production and, and money into our Ibiza shows. Okay. I mean, just before we throw the floor open to some questions, can you just sum up, each of you, how you think you, you as a team work so well with and for Tim? Start with you, Ash. Why I think we work well as a team? Yeah, what, what's, what's your strengths as the three of you? Because everyone, you know, at the end of the day, everyone's a fan of the music, and that's what it's all about. You know, we, we met each other, came together as fans of the music, feeling that we, kinda, we have a real understanding for, for not just the music that comes from Tim, but generally, you know, we listen to everything in, in the office, you know, and we're big music consumers. Um, and that's, uh, that's where it all stems from. And then obviously, um, there are really high demands on every individual in the team, and everyone who's on the team meets those demands. Is it useful for you having these guys around you when you're going out making these deals around the world? Yeah, I mean, Ash is a very controversial manager and, you know, he likes having his whip whipping me, whipping Carl, whipping everyone in the team on a nice, you know, friendly way <laughs> sometimes. Um, but I, I think, you know, every, every one of us, we care a lot about all of our artists and about each other and, yeah, caring is, is a big part of the team. Mm -hmm. And when you're going out and meeting, you know, big clients like Sony and Ralph Lauren, are you finding that, you know, they're taking you seriously, they're taking your artists seriously? Of course, and I think like one of our biggest strengths that we have always proven when we go into these kind of relationships is that we tend to start educating the brand on how they should reach their target audience and by, by all, also like contributing to their overall marketing plans and activities, obviously we, we become you know, an important partner for them where they would listen to us and try to 
you know, working in bigger organizations that we are, that are less flexible, um, trying to meet us and try to do fun stuff. Great. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, we've got four and a half minutes left. Is there any questions from the floor? The microphone here. Hi, Alex Prospect. Uh, I've got a question for Ash. Um, as a new artist trying to create my own brand, um, I'm very interested in the creative process uh, that you've had behind creating Avicii's band, brand. I was wondering, uh, was that you and Tim sitting down together one day, uh, sort of coming up with ideas on paper, or was it um, all the brand ideas kind of came together more naturally? Um, they, 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 they came very intuitively from just what Tim was about as a producer, um, you know, obviously his personality, but also where we wanted to take the brand. You know, we wanted it to be an international brand. We wanted it to be, um, or, or at least I did, even in the you know the early days. I wanted it to be to be as huge as it could be. So um, it was developed from that idea onwards. I mean, it, it it couldn't be too put together because then it would would have been plastic and it wouldn't have been real. But um, it had to have authentic roots. That's where we started. Anything else? Over here. Thank you. Hi, Ash. We heard very briefly you touch on the subject of House of Hunger, which I believe you set up with Tim, and uh, amazing feat of donating a million dollars for homeless people. Is that going to be an ongoing project? Well, um, that, that was put together um, because Tim and I were approached by a lot of different charity organizations, and they asked us to do stuff for free, and we said, okay, well, how are we going to pick which ones to do, because we can't do them all. And, and also, we thought, well, we don't even know um, what, what our contribution really um, gets them. You know, do they use it to build their brand? Do they, you know, what do they use the money for? We can't control anything. So, so Tim and I spoke, and I said, let's do something uh, ourselves and traveling through the US um, around that time, our main market, um, we'd seen a side of the US that, you know, when we back, went back to Europe, nobody was really writing about or, or, or speaking about. Um, and we discovered that there were so many, you know, hungry kids and families, um, and, and it was a very common problem in the US. And we felt, okay, we're, we're making all this money there. Why don't we give back and do it our way? So we set up that, that, uh, that charity based on, um, the simplest way of controlling, which was we could buy, through an organization called Feeding America, we could buy eight meals per dollar. And we knew exactly what every dollar could, could yield. So that's why we set that up. Now, if we continue that or if we do something else, I don't know, but you know, it's still live um, with our partnerships in there. I mean, we did continue it with, and gave away a million euros 2013 to, to Africa. So, so far, I think we've, in that, you know, with that charity or with that organization, we've, uh, we've already donated over, over two and a half million dollars. Uh, so I have a few questions. Um, I want to touch on the idea that you guys are in the pay to play system, uh, paying to play at Ultra, also the amount of money you spend on uh, publicity, also the 50-50 riding and production credits that you, Ash, get. I was wondering if you guys, is it more of a, like a modern day Milli Vanilli or Black Box situation? Who actually is producing the music? And what does your music actually stand for in the whole giant scope of electronic music or just music generally? Well, um, it's not really 50-50, first of all. Um, Tim is the main producer. I mean, I've, I've always been the executive producer and sometimes I have more input and sometimes I have less, but you know, it's, it's been a big journey that we, that we made together where you know, I, you know, I, had, I had ideas and Tim had ideas and we, we merged them into, into the same brand. But ultimately, Tim is, you know, Tim is the producer, so he's, he's the main guy. Um, now, um, to answer your second question, I believe, if I can recall them correctly, um, what it means for electronic music, the music that we create, um, we're not trying to persuade anybody in particular where, as any musician would, you know, in our core um, agenda, we're trying to expose the music to as many people as possible. Now, we started in electronic music and we believe we're still there because we're we, we feel we're staying true to the original sound that we created, which is based on energetic, you know, uplifting melodies. Um, I think that it just ha we've been fortunate enough to be able to influence a lot in the scene. And there's nothing that we're 
that we're outright saying, you know, everybody needs to follow us or everybody needs to do what we're doing. We, we're doing something we believe in when it's appreciated. We, you know, we're, we're, we're super proud of, of the work, but um, we don't really think of it as, you know, here, here we are, we, we're gonna come in and show everyone how it's done. That's not what this is about. Okay, I'm afraid we're out of time now, but just say thank you everyone and thank you to Ash, Panos and Carl. Team Avicii.